Okay, um, so uh, I feel honoured to be presenting to you all today um, about something that I'm very passionate about. And um, we have a fantastic turnout. I can't believe we've got close to 100 people in this room and 400 people out there in cyberspace. So just, you know, Trevor Shell's uh, work in the past to, to generate this kind of um, forum is pretty amazing. So the, just want to mention that up front. I also just want to acknowledge the OCAO team. Um, a lot of information that I'm going to be presenting I've actually borrowed from John Odick in uh, Hamilton, the Hamilton Clinic, who's the longest serving hygienist with OCAO. And also I want to acknowledge um, a colleague of mine from Australia, Gary Foster. I've borrowed from his slides as well. Um, and really, it's about everyone in this room. Uh, what can we do? to avoid noise, not only for ourselves, but for all our workers, out, all the workers out there. And if you think about um, how important our hearing is, and you know, Helen Keller, who was both uh, blind and deaf, she, she couldn't see people, but she felt that uh, blindness cuts people off from things, but deafness, deafness cuts people off from people. So you just imagine how lonely you must feel in that situation. We can be part of a conversation, and I know for my, myself, I'm in, in my mid-50s, and I've actually spent quite a bit of time in mining. Um, and when I was, did some work in England when I was about 19, I stood next to a guillotine catching uh, pieces of sheet steel and stacking them. And there was this constant bang, bang. And we didn't wear earplugs in those days, or I'm sure some people did, but I didn't. And I think I'm suffering um, because of that now. So if I'm in a noisy uh, restaurant, I just, I don't, sometimes I just won't talk because I can't hear what people are telling me. Um, and if somebody rings me on my cell, I, I just say, look, I'm, I'm really not going to be able to hear you where I am. And, you know, if I've got my headphones, I'll put my headphones on. So I'm sure that a lot of people in this room can relate to what I'm talking about. Um, so, Daryl, if you could just set the first hyperlink off for me, please. Thanks. Just let it resonate for a little while. Um, and if you can uh, hit the next uh, hyperlink for me, please. Thank you. So that brings me to the objectives of this presentation. Um, 
I'm not going to provide training on noise. Um, what I'm going to do is share up-to-date information with you, and um, I just want to hopefully raise, raise your awareness about noise and how big a hazard it is for everyone. Um, and I might just make a point now of saying that it's really everyone's responsibility um, that we, we, we provide solutions to this problem. And um, I also want to promote the International Noise Awareness Day, which is on the 26th of April. So I don't know if maybe some of you might have your calendars or diaries in front of you, but you might just want to write down the 26th of April and, and think what, is, what can you do to actually uh, promote noise awareness. And I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that in a, in a while. Um, so for proper training, there's a new Canadian standard. Um, uh, it's about setting up a program, a hearing loss prevention program. Um, but then for more international uh, harmonized training, there's a group called the Occupational Hygiene Training Association. So if you go to um, oh.learning and you go through that hyperlink, there's actually a student manual, there's PowerPoint presentations, and there's also uh, trainer's material as well. So all of the information is provided free of charge, um, and it's just a, use, use, a, a great uh, resource for anyone who wants to sort of roll out training in noise. That's just what the, um, the website goes, looks like. So it's, it's basically standardizing the training around the world so that people are sort of using a consistent approach. And it, you know, it's, it's a high sort of level of quality with the training, I guess. Um, so the, the, hearing, sorry, the, the hearing loss um, prevention program management standard is a new standard in Canada. And um, I, I just noticed that it's, it's a C document that's formed part of this standard is actually an Australian standard. So it would be remiss of me not to say that because I'm Australian and quite often, you know, I'll, I'll talk about stuff that comes from Australia and I just, I think this is a good example of where it's, there's some really useful information in that standard as well. Um, so when you're looking at the, the Canadian standard, it's probably good also to look at the Australian standard. Um, so a program involves a lot of different elements. It's not just about putting workers in earplugs. Really, where we're trying to get is we're trying to get to control the level of exposure. We want to prevent people from getting noise-induced hearing loss. So really, we should be controlling. Um, I don't really want to go too much into the theory, but it is quite interesting if you think about um, noises really just being pressure, pressure waves, um, which is energy, basically. So if you think about the wave um, above and below ambient pressure, and there's different ways to measure noise. You can measure peak noise, or you can me measure average noise for that wave. Um, it's root mean square, but I won't go into it. But there's different ways that you can actually measure noise. And I'll, I will talk a bit more about that further on down the track. Um, and so if you think about amplitude, like amplitude is loudness. But then if you think about pitch, pitch is frequency. So if you think about these waves, when they get closer together and they move quicker, that's, um, that's high frequency noise. But when the wavelength's very long, that's low frequency noise. So typically, you know, it's good to measure the peak noise, the average noise, and also get an idea of what the frequency spectrum is as well. And um, we can hear over of a lot of different um, sound pressures. So what, ha what we've actually done, or what you know, the scientists have done, they've actually converted pressures to what they call the decibel scale. So we can actually, um, we're talking about you know, fewer units. But you've got to remember that this is a logarithmic scale. So just a few decibels will make a really big difference.
Okay, um, so, you know, I guess in summer, I mean, I, I live in Newfoundland, so we don't have much summer there, um, but when the grass does grow and we do walk on it, um, if we keep walking on it, the, the grass actually starts to sort of like, you know, lose its elasticity and start to lie flat. And if we keep walking on that grass, after a while we'll, we'll kill it. Or if we even leave something lying on the grass that will kill it. So in our, in our, um, in our cochlea, um, what we have is all these little, little hairs, they're cells. So if you think about noise hitting these hairs, they keep going like that. And after a while, if there's enough noise, um, the hairs actually die. And we've got a limited number of hairs in our cochlea, and they don't grow back. So it's, it is preventable, but it's not curable. So I think that's really important to keep in mind. And it's also chronic, so it, it can actually creep up on you. And before you know it, you've got noise-induced hearing loss, and it's too late. Um, and I guess I'm just trying to think about today being a repetitive strain injury day. So what we're actually talking about is we're talking about injuring these little hairs in the cochlea. And it is repetitive if you think about these noise waves constantly hitting these little hairs. So it is a repetitive strain in, in, a, in a way. It's just, uh, they're just uh, 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 photographs under the electron microscope to show what we're talking about here. And, it, you know, the, 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 the areas are amazing instruments when you think about it. You know, you've got this um, canal that actually will take out, or will actually measure the different frequencies as the uh, pressure. So it actually goes through here and it goes around like that. And if the, it's, we've actually got a, a frequent analyzer, a frequency analyzer in our ear. So it's a pretty phenomenal instrument when you think like that. Um, so if you think about the number of claims and how much it costs, you know, for noise-induced hearing loss, it's quite phenomenal. Um, and it's really, you know, it's, it's one of the, 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 the highest hazards. And um, what is also interesting is that um, we have a limit. Uh, it's 85 decibels. It's sort of fairly universal now, this 85 decibel limit that's over an eight-hour period. Um, maybe some people don't realize that even at 80, 80 decibels, um, we do start to get some noise-induced hearing loss. So there is still a risk at 80. So I just, as I go through this talk, just keep that in mind because 85 decibels isn't a, safe, isn't a fine dividing line between safe and unsafe exposure. Really what we want to try and do is uh, maintain exposure below 80 decibels. Um, and I just want to talk about the... There's a lot of people here online in cyberspace from Ontario. Um, and I want to talk about the legislation. I'll talk a bit more about that in, in a minute. But if you think about um, the number of people in construction that develop hearing loss, and it's really only recently that the legislation here in Ontario actually covered um, noise in the regulations, which is I find quite sort of astounding. Um, so I'm sure many people in this room have actually gone and had their hearing tested. Um, but next time you do, it, it's worthwhile looking at your audiogram and seeing the shape of it. So typically with noise-induced hearing loss, so this actually uh, represents um, fishermen in the US. And, you know, fishermen, who would have thought the fishermen would have noise-induced hearing loss? But what this study showed was, I think these were shrimp, shrimp fishermen. Um, more than 50% of them actually had some form of noise-induced hearing loss. Um, but going back to your own audiogram, um, you know, if you look at it, um, you might just want to look at the shape of it. And you might want to look at this, what they call a 4,000 hertz notch. So if you've got a V around 4,000, um, you 
could have noise-induced hearing loss. Um, typically what happens as you get older, um, you lose your hearing in the higher frequency, so the shape is more like that. But when you get this V, this 4,000 hertz notch, it's more related to, uh, or it's related to noise-induced hearing loss. Um, you know, noise causes a lot of different things. Um, and I just put this um, up to, to, to demonstrate that. Um, but I was talking about the constant uh, noise exposure and the pressure going into your ear and using grass as an analogy. So what, when you first start losing your hearing, you get what's called temporary threshold shift. So you can actually detect early signs of hearing loss by looking at temporary threshold shift. Um, so there is a temporary change in hearing. But I guess there's so many other um, 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 consequences of being exposed to noise. And if you think about fatigue, you know, if you sleep in an area where it's quite noisy, you're not getting good sleep. You might get, you know, interrupted sleep. Um, you know, it's uh, the, the, the communication um, underground. It's just there's so many different variables. So it's really, if we think about human factors and ergonomics, then it really, it, there's, a, there's an effect there too. Uh, so the legislation in Ontario, as I said, you know, it's really just covered construction, but now it covers health and like farming and teachers and, you know, all, all industry out there. So it's, um, uh, but we also, um, we need to play catch up um, and I was talking to Kimball earlier on about this, just trying to understand uh, legislation here. And Kimberly told me that um, the legislation had something in there about personal protective equipment. So, you know, I guess there may be overuse, an overuse of hearing protection, for example, because that's the way the legislation has driven it. Um, so personal protective equipment is a last resort. I just really want to make that clear, um, and I'll talk a bit more about that. Um, so you see that the first efforts to change the legislation started back in 1979. and 2016, the legislation changed to cover um, noise for all workplaces. Um, but we know that workers will still lose their hearing between 80 to 85, so it really makes good sense to keep uh, noise exposures below 80 decibels. Uh, so um, really it's about employers uh, taking you know, all measures reasonably necessary to protect workers. Um, protective measures against noise exposure in, in, include engineering controls, work practices, and personal protective equipment. But engineering control should be number one. Um, you know, we can assess noise levels, um, and that should be done without any use of personal protective equipment. And, and the, the, the legislative, the regulations are a minimum standard. I just want you to keep that in mind. Um, it takes a long time to change the regulation, so it's very important to understand what the risk is without looking at what the regulations say. Um, um, but the regulations include this 85 decibels. Um, and for those hygienists out there, um, the idea is you, what you do is you don't actually adjust the exposure limit down. When you measure the noise, you actually normalize that measurement for an eight-hour period. And then you compare that uh, normalized value against the limit. You don't do it the other way around. Um, and I just thought I'd bring this to your attention too. Uh, I've noticed there's a, a few provinces in Canada that have actually dropped um, what we call... Um, 140 dB. So there's another kind of limit. There's a, a peak limit. Uh, in the US, they uh, also measure peak noise. And also in Australia, they measure peak noise. And in Ontario, they've actually dropped this measure from the legislation. Um, I, I don't know why. Somebody might be able to tell me why one day, but I'm still trying to figure out why that is. 
And I just, if you look at the way that peak noise is measured, the actual equipment that you use, uh, you actually have to have it set up to measure peak noise. So you, you, you really can't measure um, A-weighted noise and then equate that back to peak. But I just thought I'd raise that. Um, and there's a lot of, lot of words there, but uh, basically what this slide is saying, that in Sweden, um, a, web, a questionnaire was sent out via the web to workplaces. So they had workplaces that were inspected by the regulators and also workplaces that weren't inspected. And what they found is that where there was inspection, there was a lot more action, which is concerning, isn't it, when you think about it, you know, that it takes a regulator to come into a workplace to make change. But I think in Ontario, with the uh, internal responsibility system, it's about everyone in this room and we protect ourselves and our workers without relying on regulators to come and tell us what to do. But, and we can even have our, our own internal um, inspection regime to, to actually drive that change. But they did actually, so they did show that inspections are effective in reducing noise exposure. I guess it comes back to the old adage of uh, what gets measured um, gets noticed, what gets noticed gets action. And I've got a couple of questions I want to ask you at this point. Um, so I guess the first question is, um, Who's measured noise here? I'd say probably about five, maybe a couple of percent of the room. Um, who's actually been part of a noise survey? Who's actually had an instrument put on them to measure their, your noise exposure? A couple of percent, wow. Okay. Um, who in this room thinks that they may, you know, through, through looking at audiograms, speaking to their doctor, may have um, some noise-induced hearing loss, industrial deafness. Okay. Who thinks they may just because they struggle to hear people in a crowded room or... Okay. I just thought I'd ask those questions to, to gauge the responses. Um, so in a, a workplace, it's really important to know where the hot spots are. So you can actually get a, a, a map of the workplace and you can actually identify the hot spots where the noise sources are really loud. So this is a really good tool, not only to figure out what needs to be lowered, what controls need to be put in place to lo lower the noise, but also where hearing protection is required. And um, there's um, some guidance coming out of Belgium. Um, there's a professor called Professor Melcher or Malcher. I can never figure out how to pronounce his name properly. Um, he's actually, an uh, OCAO have actually taken his approach, um, Professor Malcher's approach, and they've developed their own booklet. So it's actually a booklet using the Sobane approach um, for noise. And the beauty of this approach is that uh, workers on the shop floor can solve the problem through screening. Many of the problems, the exposure problems, can actually be solved at the, sh at the, at the floor by the workers who understand what the problem is. Uh, what typically may happen is that you might organize a consultant to come in, charge you a lot of money, provide a sophisticated report, and then nothing get done with that. Nothing gets done with that report. It might get put in a like a draw, bottom drawer of somebody's desk. So the idea is to engage everyone in the process and, and through screening. So that's what this booklet is sort of geared towards. Um, in saying that, um, we now have the capability to actually measure noise just through our iPhone. So you know, when you go back to your workplace or wherever, if you want to understand what the noise level is, you can actually just download an app. And um, this one here is about $5, so it's SPLN, 
Um, it gives you octave band analysis. It gives you an average exposure. You can actually watch the, the, um, the dial and you can see the level. So it gives you a visual. Um, there's, a, there's a cheaper one. I hear it's about $2, which doesn't have the octave band analysis. It's a bit more simple. But it's a really good screen, if you like. And, you know, it's really about controlling noise exposure. So if you can use this to get an idea of what the noise is and figure out where the controls need to be implemented, you can say, well, we need to, we need to do something with this noise. Put the controls in, and then you can do a measurement after just to show that there's been quite a big reduction in the noise um, level. Of course, you know, we have more, um, more accurate instruments. Um, so this is a, an integrating handheld sound level meter, and we may shadow someone to measure what they're being exposed to, and we can accurately measure the noise with that. Or there's what uh, is known as a dosimeter. We can actually put this uh, dosimeter on someone's um, lapel and measure what they're exposed to. So we can then compare that to an eight-hour limit. Um, but really, it, with my experience, just you know, through screening, it, we can be sort of driven down to the to, to, to the control stage. And I guess then for compliance, for following up, and really you know, making sure that no one is at risk, then we might want to sort of employ this more sophisticated gear, that, you know, for compliance monitoring, perhaps. Um, so, uh, OKL OK have um, calculators on their website, and uh, if you think about um, the calculations that are required to, uh, you know, in, to, to, to get the results, it um, it takes a bit of work. But this is all done for you on the website, and it's color coded. So, typically, we want to see people in the green zone. So you just put in the noise level. You measure with your, your iPhone app uh, how long the person was exposed. And then it will just tell you whether or not the, the person's at risk. And uh, So that, that one was just for a full uh, uh, comparing against the, the eight-hour limit. And this one's a bit more sophisticated. You can actually look at different tasks in the job. So you basically put the tasks and you will look at what someone was exposed to for that task. And the idea is not to get above 100% dose in any task. And where you get above 100%, then you can actually look at that task and um, make modifications to make that task quieter. Um, there's, so there's, there's a number of apps available out there. And so the one that I showed you to begin with was this one. There's the hyperlink to that one. Um, which really sends a powerful message, doesn't it, that we just we need to avoid noise and not throw our hearing away. Um, I think I might just share this with you. It's something that I've found out through OCAO. The, there is an app um, to measure reverberation. So what reverberation is? It's reflection. So if you've got a, like, a lot of shiny surfaces in a room, not a lot of soft furnishings, you get a lot of reflection of noise. And so this app will actually measure that kind of reverberation. And uh, there's a perfect application, if you like, um, in, in schools with teachers. Um, what some of the OCAS staff have found is that if you've got, really, if you've got a lot of reverberation, a lot of reflection, um, teachers have to raise their voice, and they almost have to talk really loudly. And what it can actually happen is you get um, uh, nodules growing on your vocal cords. And so you can end up being injured just because of poor reverberation in a room. So it's really important that the design of the room is such that there's, there's, there's very little reverberation. Um, uh, this is, a, um, as I said, um, I've, I've borrowed heavily on a uh, presentation from John Udick, and I did this the other day. So it's an online audiometric test. And so you basically get your computer, you put your headphones in the computer, and you actually you, you go through each of these columns. So you just basically have your headphones on, you click on it from the quietest to the loudest, and then you stop as soon as you can hear the noise coming through the headphones. 
So it gives you an idea of whether or not you could have noise-induced hearing loss. So it's, it's just a really good screen once again. Um, uh, where's Trevor? How am I going for time, Trevor? How, how long have I got left? 15? Okay. Um, so the idea is really to control its source and then look at the pathway, which I'll talk about. Um, but really, you know, exposure is as a, 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 when it gets to the receiver, when we actually receive the noise, then this sort of thing really should be a last resort as, or a, as a way of controlling exposure until the, the, the actual controls are put in place. And it's really important that we check the effectiveness of controls. So I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Um, so, you know, we can actually buy quiet. So we can have policies in place when, whenever we bring um, instrumentation or equipment onto our workplace that it's already quiet before we actually put it in place. Um, and also think about the pathways of noise. So noise can be transmitted through the air but it actually can, it can travel through, um, through um, structure-borne material. So if you think about metal touching metal, you can actually f find that noise actually travels through the metal just through vibration. It's not that difficult, really, if you think about it. Um, so there's a piece of equipment. It might be a, a motor in a factory and it, it hasn't got any noise control on it at all. So then if you put these um, maybe little rubber mats underneath the motor, so you, uh, you isolate that equipment from what's underneath it, then you're not, not going to get the noise transmitted through this, this, this surface here. And you do get some benefit in doing that. And then you think, well, maybe if I put an enclosure over it, I will also get benefit. But if you put the mats and the enclosure, then you get more benefit. But then if you put material inside of the enclosure that actually absorbs the noise, so it stops the reverberation, then you end up getting quite a big reduction in noise. So you can walk around and you can look at the equipment and you can sort of think about what can be done to control the, 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 the levels here. And this is an example of, um, if you think of a, a, a truck cabin, Think of all the ways that noise can get into the truck cabin. Um, and you look at uh, a, a particular material that you can actually line the truck cabin with. And just line, line the cabin. Maybe put some uh, acoustical formats on the floor of the truck. And then um, there was a problem where this um, cabin had uh, about 95 decibels getting into it. Um, so the m material was applied and they ended up getting a reduction of 11 decibels. So they went from, uh, from 95 to 84. That's a big reduction, isn't it, if you think about noise being a logarithmic scale. Uh, here's another example in an underground mining environment where there's some ductwork. And typically, you know, you hang the ductwork by chains so just breaking up the metal chain links with something that's not metal, um, you're stopping the transmission of noise through the metal there. Um, if you think about um, a truck exhaust, um, you know, if it's a fairly sort of a short bend, you get a lot of turbulence, quite a high level of noise. If you sort of have a longer bend, you have less turbulence, so you, you have less noise. Um, think about um, installing different kinds of fans. There's ways that you can install them where they will be uh, quieter. Um, and I guess a fan in a duct, you know, it's when air gets sucked into a duct through this fan, um, if, if you don't put a cone at the front there, you get a big, tr not, not only do you get a big pressure drop, so it's not very effective because the air going into the duct isn't really being captured effectively. It's actually quite noisy. Um, and then if you put the, 
the fan two to three duct diameters into the duct as well, then you can also reduce the noise level at the same time. Um, but this, unfortunately, this is what where we are at the moment. Um, putting workers, or putting earplugs on, on ourselves, in ourselves, and uh, if you think about the difference between what the factory and what the lab test tells you about the reduction that you get in exposure wearing the earplugs and the real world level of attenuation, you can see it's not very effective, is it? And even if you take those earplugs off for a short period of time, you're still exposed to quite a, a high level of noise. So, you know, wear time is very important. Um, but it's not really a permanent solution, is it? And even you can just walk around the workplace and look at everyone and just see how well the earplugs are fitting. And you can say, well, you know, maybe this person could fit their earplugs a little bit better. Um, there are kits available where you can actually test the effectiveness of the fit. Um, and I've just got an example here um, where you actually put headphones over the top of the earplugs. Um, you get you get a signal of noise go into the ears, and you you know basically you indicate whether you can hear the noise or not. So if there's a good fit with the earplugs, then obviously you're going to have a, a positive test result. Um, I'll just share my experience from Australia. They found for for many years, you know, that the hearing protection programs weren't very effective. But once they started implementing fit testing for earplugs they found there was quite a big improvement. So, you know, we test, we fit test workers with respirators. Why, oops, oops, a bit animated there. <laughs> um, why not, why not earplugs? Um, so that brings me back to the uh, 26th of April. And um, so, okay, we're doing quite a bit of work in this area. Um, there's a, a Provincial Occupational Disease Action Plan, and both Kimberly O'Connell and John Udick are sort of leading up that group with the system partners, the provincial partners which are under the Ministry of Labour. So OCA are playing a big part in this as well, that um, they, by the 26th of April, there will be a, a, an online survey available on the web. So. What I encourage everyone to do in this room is actually download the app, take the measurements, and then report those measurements uh, to a, you know to your supervisor, to the management, just to people to promote it. But also, there's a, there's also a way that you can actually report what you're finding through the OK portable as well. So it's really just a a data collection information system. Um, I might refer to my colleagues if anybody wants to add to that. Val, did you want to say anything there? Sorry to put you on the spot. No, 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 it's okay. I well, Actually, again. Kimberly might. Did you want to? Ask him? Maybe, Kimberly, if you're up there. Your light's on. Oh, how's that? Maybe I just wasn't projecting properly. So the crowdsourcing that um, Kevin's referring to is an initiative that's part of, um, part of noise being a priority for the whole prevention system for 2017, 2018. And that's from a prevention perspective. And one of the things we've realized about occupational disease in general, including noise-induced hearing loss, which is the uh, number one um, occupational disease in terms of number of people exposed, as well as um, costs, WSIB costs, and never mind the number of cases that aren't, uh, aren't submitted for compensation. So it's a, it's, a, it's a major issue. It affects millions of people. Um, so anything, one of the things we realized is that in general, we don't know what levels people are exposed to. On average in Ontario, there isn't a lot of exposure data that's known or, or even the Ministry of Labour, when they visit websites, they, you know, they take a few measurements, but a lot of times nowadays, they're very short staffed, so they end up saying, have a workplace hire a consultant and do a, do a noise survey, but the levels that, a, that the consultant takes never end up in any 
kind of public database. They're, they're shared with the company, the companies solve their own things, the Joint Health and Safety Committee, and they work on it. But it, it, as a system and as a province, we don't really know how loud, how noisy are Ontario workplaces, or even national workplaces or worldwide. So as part of the initiatives around raising um, awareness around noise, which is the campaign will be called Avoid Noise, we're creating a crowdsourcing site in, in tandem with OCAO and of course uh, Mike Son, who is uh, our computer expert as well as an ergonomics expert. It's going to help us build it and we're asking people to share the, your noise levels in your workplace on April 26th. We, it will run you know, it, it won't end, it won't stop and start on the 26th. But on the 26th, we would like to capture as many workplaces as possible um, in Ontario and Canada and around the world. We've already had interest expressed um, in other jurisdictions. So we're hoping to sort of have this catch on. And every year on April 26th, maybe we can actually start seeing a pattern of having raised awareness that maybe the noise levels will actually go down over time. But it will help us all understand the level of exposure if people will um, participate. So, thanks, Val. And just to um, just to, to take it a step further in this presentation, um, there's actually a questionnaire provided on uh, ten ways to recognise hearing loss, um, and there's also uh, a way that you can sort of qualitatively assess the noise just by how loud you have to speak to be heard. Um, and there's also a place where you can put listing your noise sources in in the factory. And then there's also some prompts about you know, how to reduce the noise through control. So all of these are control uh, questions. And the very one, last one is a hearing protection. So really, we, we need to be thinking about getting lots, lots of yeses for the controls. Um, so with the Canadian standard, when you want to uh, assess whether the Canadian standard is actually in place, the program's in place, there's some questions provided in that, and I've got that in this presentation, through visual inspection. And then just by work here interviews, you can uh, do a, an assessment as well. Um, I've also put in um, a reference to the Australian standard that's made up of five components. And it's quite an involved standard, but there is um, quite a big section on noise control. So there is an assessment in that standard, so you can do a self-assessment on, on noise control. So. Anybody in this room can make a noise measurement. It's really about control. It's not about putting workers or wearing earplugs. We really need to control at source preferably. And don't forget uh, International Noise Awareness Day. Kevin, any questions? Hi, Kevin. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, what is the current, in Ontario, current decibel, acceptable decibel levels, standard? Uh, I heard it went down recently. Yeah, the, the, limit, the limit is 85 decibels um, over an eight-hour period. It's, how long has that been in place? Did it not drop down to 83 recently? Uh, no, it's 85. Um, but typically, if you have uh, worked 12-hour shifts, then you have to adjust that ex the exposure, um, and then you compare that normalized exposure with the exposure limit. If you were to ex adjust the exposure limit for a 12-hour shift, it would be co probably come down 85, but you wouldn't adjust the limit. You'd, you'd adjust the actual exposure, if you know what I mean. But it's 85 is the statutory limit here. And the, as I said, unfortunately, there's no limit for peak noise. So my recommendation to everyone in this room is if, if, you, if, if you get a consultant to do a survey, ask them to measure peak noise using the C-weighted scale as well, just to get that additional information, which will tell you more about risk as well. I do have an online question, but I'll come, uh, well, I'll go ahead and then I'll come to the gentleman at the front. Um, so the question online is, I work in an office environment with newly introduced white noise. There are many complaints at the annoyance and inability to speak with a coworker eight feet away. 
I know that this is not a concerning level of noise. It's only 54 decibels um, on the A weighting scale measured at dust height. But are you aware of any research about the levels of white noise that may increase or decrease productivity? Uh, there, are, there will be, uh, you know, design limits for, you know, indoor inv sort of environments, office environments, but I'm not aware of what they are. I'm sure other people in this room might know what they are. But I think this is a perfect example where um, if you look at the reverberation, there may be things to sort of reduce the amount of reverberation so that, you know, it, it's easier to hear people and the... Uh, because what happens with all this reflection happening in a room, when you speak, the loudness is actually higher, like it's higher because of the reflection. So if you, you reduce that reflection, then the loudness won't be quite as high. And I, I'm just talking to John off the top of my head. There was quite a big reduction when they used this app looking at, or when they, they reduced the reverberation in, uh, in schools, for example. Uh, hi, Kevin. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, International Noise Awareness Day. I think fabulous uh, focus. I'm wondering, I, I realize we're talking about the workplace. I, I, I'm wondering if there's going to be any kind of uh, targeted information, particularly to young people, uh, pre-exposure in, in the workplace. Uh, I travel the public bus system once in a while, and I sit a couple of seats from uh, a set of earphones that I can hear the music. And, you know, the kind of uh, damage that people are doing to themselves, even, you know, outside the workplace, uh, needs to be addressed. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great point, because typically when we measure noise, we just measure noise in a workplace, and sometimes we tend to overlook what's happening out there in the background. Um, but there are limits, 24-hour limits. Um, so the ACGI, the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists, have a 24-hour limit, which is 80 decibels. But in saying that, you, you know, you really want to try and get the overall noise exposure probably down less than, say, 70 decibels. The, the thing is, what happens, you need a certain amount of recovery time. If you're exposed to loud noise, then you need a lot of quiet time in between those subsequent loud noise exposures for your hearing to sort of recover for those little sort of cells to bounce back, if you like. Um, so it's really important that when we do an assessment, we sort of take all those other things into account. So thanks for the question. I work at an underground mine, and we actually use the DV blockers, the molded DV blockers. Are those any better than the regular, like you showed, the regular earplugs? Do we have the full mirror plugs? Um, well, my understanding is when they're molded, and someone else might be able to help me here, when they're molded, they're actually molded for your, 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 your own ear, so they're personally designed to fit your, your ear. So I haven't seen any statistics, and I haven't really done, read any research, but you would think that they'd be more effective, but I'd have to qualify that. 